Okay, we're ready to go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time Briefing on Tuesday, January 12th, titled Sloan, the Energizer Bunny of Sky Surveys. My name is Susanna Kohler. I'm the editor of AAS Nova, and I'm going to be your MC for this briefing. And I am assisted today by Astrobytes media intern, Haley Wall, who will be monitoring the Q&A. Uh, Astro, uh, AAS media fellow, Tharni Kanchati, who will be keeping an eye on the Slack channel for the AAS press conferences. And uh, Rick points out, AAS press officer, Rick Feinberg, points out that this is now the first press conference in his 12 years of hosting press conferences where he doesn't have an official role, which means he's just gonna be doing everything because he's Rick and probably coming up with brilliant questions to ask all of our panelists. Um, so let's get started. Um, for today's briefing, there are going to be three press releases that are distributed via um, AAS.org homepage. There's astronomy in the news section there. So the press releases will go up there and they'll also be tweeted out via the AAS Press Twitter account. Um, reminder that this briefing is being recorded and uh, broadcast live on YouTube. And if you're interested in viewing any of the videos from the previous three uh, conferences, they have all been uploaded at this point. Rick has been busy. So they're all on the AAS Press Office YouTube channel at this point. Um, okay, so if you've never been to one of these before, the way this is going to work is that I'm going to give a brief introduction to the topic and introduce our speakers for today. Uh, then each of them will go through and give their presentations. And at the very end, we will move to a Q&A session, which will be monitored by Haley. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have comments on the questions or you want to upvote questions that other people are asking, please do so. Uh, that will bump them up in the queue. So then we'll ask them in order at the end. Uh, and please remember, if you do ask a question, to identify yourself and your affiliation and identify who you're asking the question of, if it's applicable. Uh, and note that we will have the presenters not answer these questions live via, uh, in real time via text chat, but rather they will be answering them at the very end during the Q&A session so that we can hear the answers audibly and that will go into the recording. So. I think that's it for the mechanics. So I'm going to go ahead now and introduce the topic. We're going to be talking about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which has this lovely title, Energizer Bunny of Sky Surveys, because it just keeps coming up in all of the press conferences. Um, Sloan has been around now for literally decades. I actually visited Sloan uh, as an REU student in the summer of 2006 when it was in phase two, now we're finishing up phase four. And not only has it been around for quite some time, but there's constantly new and exciting science coming out of it. So the last press conference we had that was dedicated to Sloan was in 2019. But there was also one that was dedicated to Sloan in 2018 and one in 2017 and one in 2016 and 2015. So uh, there's a lot of great stuff coming out of Sloan. So today, what we will be hearing about is first up, we've got Hannah Lewis from the University of Virginia and Jasmine Washington from the University of Arizona. And they'll be presenting on extragalactic symbiotic stars in the Apogee survey. Then we're gonna have Allison Sheffield from LaGuardia Community College talking about identifying new members of the Gillum Stellar Stream. Then Karen Masters from Haverford College We'll discuss Galaxy Zoo 3D, crowdsourcing the identification of features in nearby galaxies. And lastly, Michael Blanton from New York University and Juna Kohlmeyer from Carnegie Observatories will present a handoff from SDSS 4 to SDSS 5. So I will go ahead and mute and turn this over to Hannah and Jasmine. Thanks, Susanna. I will share my screen. There we go. So hello, everybody, again. Uh, my name is Hannah Lewis. I'm a graduate student at the University of Virginia. 
And I, along with Jasmine Washington, a graduate student at the University of Arizona, are going to talk to you today about our studies of symbiotic stars and present the first complete system architecture for symbiotic binaries outside of our galaxy. Binary stars are very common in our galaxy. Currently, we think that about half of all stars exist in pairs and orbit about one another in space. There have been many theoretical and observational studies which confirm this, and we even have some understanding about how those systems might form, what their properties are, and how they evolve over time. However, we don't know much about what binary stars might look like in other galaxies. It would be really easy to just assume all binary stars form the same in all galaxies, regardless of what those galaxies look like. But based on our understanding of binary systems in the Milky Way, the properties of binary systems likely depend on the environment that they form in. And those environmental properties can vary vastly between galaxies, so it is really important to extend, expand our search for binary systems beyond the Milky Way. And this is where Apogee comes in. Apogee, the Apache Point Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment, is one of the component surveys of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Apogee's goal is to collect spectra of stars using twin spectrographs, one in each hemisphere, which allow it to see the entire Milky Way and beyond. The Northern Instrument has been operating on the Sloan Telescope at Apache Point Observatory, New Mexico, for almost 10 years now. And the Southern Instrument on the DuPont Telescope at Las Campanas Observatory in Chile has been operating for about four years. The sky map on the lower right here shows a galactic projection of the survey area, where each point on this map shows a position on the sky where Apogee obtains at least 250 spectra of stars. And as you can see from this map, the survey has observed many stars in our Milky Way, but has also observed stars that are part of other galaxies specifically some of the small satellite galaxies that orbit the Milky Way, shown by these bright green points, including the Draco Dwarf Spheroidal and the Small Magellanic Cloud. And these two galaxies alone show how conditions in galaxies can vary widely between systems. The Draco Dwarf Spheroidal, whose members are the very faint stars that you see in this image, is very old and very dark matter dominated whereas the small Magellanic Cloud is made up of multiple populations of both old and young stars and is less dark matter dominated. So over the course of its decade long life, Apogee has observed those extra galactic stars many times over. So from shifts in the wavelengths of light observed in the spectra of those stars, using the Doppler effect, we can map orbits of binary stars outside of our galaxy. And the Doppler effect is something you're familiar with in your daily life that the pitch or the frequency of a train whistle sounds higher when the train approaches you and lower when it recedes demonstrates the Doppler effect. In the same way, the frequency of light emitted by a star moving towards us shifts towards shorter wavelengths, and the frequency of light from a star moving away from us shifts towards longer wavelengths. So using this known effect, and given many observations over time, like those provided by Apogee, we can monitor the motion of stars in binary orbits. Since even our closest galaxy neighbors are very far away, individual stars are very faint to observers here on Earth. So we need to start with the brightest possible binary systems in these galaxies. These are symbiotic stars. Symbiotids are a very rare type of binary star made up of an evolved, very bright giant star being consumed by a tiny white dwarf companion. This mass transfer is revealed by very strong emission lines in the spectra. This animation shows an illustration of known symbiotic R aquari, which is in our galaxy, just to show you what one of these systems might look like up close. By chance, two symbiotic stars, one in the Draco Dwarf spheroidal and one in the small Magellanic cloud that Hannah showed earlier, were both followed by Apogee for more than two years. Using these data, we were able to derive very precise orbital periods and masses for these systems and have developed for the first time ever a complete understanding of the architecture of an extragalactic symbiotic system. This figure shows on the x-axis the date of a given observation, and the y-axis shows the radial velocity of the giant star, so its speed towards or away from us. These flat points show real apogee data for the Draco C1 symbiotic, and the blue line shows the modeled orbit for the system. 
With our precisely derived masses for the two components of the system, thanks to these observations, we can simulate the architecture of the binary and begin to understand better the mechanisms that drive the transfer of mass from the giant star to the white dwarf. This is a simulation of the Draco C1 symbiotic. The colored paths show the path of atoms from the giant to the white dwarf, which are being accreted via a mechanism called wind roche overflow, which is not the standard model for these systems. This is one of the interesting results presented in our work. All we can see is the accretion disk around the white dwarf, as the star, as the star is too small to be seen at this scale. In the apogee spectra, we also observe emission in the hydrogen lines, which is characteristic of an interacting symbiotic binary and indicates active nuclear burning on the surface of the white dwarf. This figure shows the flux as a function of wavelength, where the black line is a model spectra for an inactive star, and the blue line shows the observed flux from the LIN358 symbiotic, which shows a broad emission feature in an infrared hydrogen line. Because Apogee has monitored these systems over long periods of time, we check for varying line strengths, which might indicate a variable accretion rate. For LIN358, we not only find that the strength of the hydrogen lines vary with time, but that these lines are observed in both emission and absorption. The orange line shows a spectrum of LIN358 taken about a year after the spectrum shown in blue. And in that time, this hydrogen line has drawn from emission to absorption. This spectral variability suggests the orbit of LIN358 is elliptical, resulting in varying accretion rates. The fact that we've been able to map the orbits for the Draco C1 and LIN358 symbiotes is really important for two reasons. First, this is an incredible step towards being able to use the larger Apogee data set to understand the properties of binary stars outside of our own galaxy. And second, if the white dwarf in the binary can accrete enough mass from its companion, symbiote stars may become type 1a supernovae. Type 1a supernovae occur when a white dwarf mass that seats a threshold of 1.4 times the mass of the sun becomes unstable and explodes. These explosions are used to measure distances in our universe. So studying extragalactic symbiote stars in great detail and being able to precisely derive their orbits and stellar parameters could provide important insights into these cosmic markers. While the systems we've looked at so far are unlikely to explode as supernovae, the fact that we can study other symbiotes outside of the Milky Way using Apogee is an exciting prospect. And so in summary, Apogee provides a wealth of data for studying binary stars both in and beyond our galaxy. We report the first complete orbital parameters derived from spectra for any symbiote star system outside our galaxy. And finally, symbiote stars specifically provide us with an important test of our understanding of type 1a supernovae. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Sheffield, and I'm an associate professor at LaGuardia Community College, which is part of the City University of New York. The work that I'll be talking about today is supported by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey's FAST initiative, which is a collaborative effort and involves students from several different CUNY campuses, as well as scientists on the Apogee team. So in this work, we found one new member of a recently discovered stellar stream in the Milky Way's halo named Jellum, and we find that it is likely not part of debris from one of the Milky Way's biggest collisions with another galaxy. So to get oriented here, the image shows the Milky Way as mapped by the Gaia satellite stretching across the center of the galaxy. We can see the disk component, and the disk is surrounded by the more diffuse halo component. And also in this image, you can see the Magellanic clouds that Hannah mentioned in the previous talk. The Milky Way halo looked rather calm in the previous image. However, 
long thin streams of stars are found all around the halo. And some of these streams are shown here from a computer visualization of the Milky Way made by Adrian Price Whalen, whose plenary talk you hopefully heard this morning. And the different colored arcs are each a different stellar stream in the halo. And finding um, halo streams is challenging, but all sky surveys like Sloan make this possible. The Jellum stream is marked on this image, along with streams from the globular cluster PAL5. So just some background, how do these thin stellar streams form? The short answer is mergers. The merging of galaxies is a universal process, and the Milky Way underwent several major mergers in the early stages of its life, including a major merger known as the Gaia Enceladus sausage, which I will call GES, and also the capture of the smaller Sagittarius galaxy. So the image on the left shows what the Milky Way's merger with GES may have looked like when the merger process began nearly 10 billion years ago. So tidal forces or simply gravity are the key to forming stellar streams and the simulation, which I'm just about to start. So this is the Sagittarius galaxy in the simulation and this is the Milky Way. So it shows this process. So as the Sagittarius galaxy is pulled into the Milky Way, the, get, the core is squeezed and stretched and you get these long thin streams of stars wrapping around the halo. Globular clusters, which are spherical groups of stars in the Milky Way's halo, can also be tidally disrupted. And streams from the Milky Way globular cluster PAL5 are shown in this image and you can see the tidal streams coming off the front and the back. So when considering the origin of a stellar stream like Jellum, we need to consider both an accreted satellite or globular cluster origins. A powerful way to find stellar streams is by looking at the color and brightness of stars that are all in the same direction on the sky. And this was part of the strategy that we used to find the Jellum, uh, the star in the Jellum stream. So this technique works because stars from a satellite galaxy or a globular cluster will bunch along a very narrow trend in this space, which is shown here as the blue line. And lines like this are called isochrones, which means same time. And fitting stars along an isochrone is an effective way of finding stars that form together. Their colors and brightnesses also tell us how far along in its life a star is. Fainter stars that fall along the main sequence are young or middle-aged, while the bright giant, the brighter giant stars are older. So the Jellum stream was first detected in 2018 um, using this technique. So main sequence stars were mapped out. And the same study also reported the proper motion signal for stars in the Jellum stream. And this was a really important piece of information. Um, all of the stars in the Jellum stream are moving in the same way. And by knowing this proper motion signal, this helps us find Jellum stars in our data. And our data is from Apogee South, and it's in the same direction of the sky as the Jellum stream. So from our uh, data, we first isolated stars with this proper motion signal. And another study of Jellum was published this summer from the S5 survey, and that's shown as the red circles here. And we used their colors and brightnesses to further constrain our search. So indeed, in the end, with the combination of proper motions and isochrone fitting, we were able to identify one new member of Jellum, and it is the brightest known giant in the Jellum stream. So next we analyzed the giant Jellum, the Jellum giant's motion and its chemistry to learn some more about its history. I mentioned the GES merger with the Milky Way earlier. So stars or debris from the GES merger have a fairly unique signature in their motions. In fact, this is how that name sausage came to be part of this. So I showed here with the purple oval, the signature for the GES stars in this sample, this is from Gaia. And we looked at our Apogee data in this exact same motion space, so circular motion and radial motions. And indeed, we were able to successfully identify some GES merger stars in our data. And they're shown here in the figure on the right as the magenta and cyan points. So I'll circle those with that same purple oval and also indicate the Jellum giants um, with the blue oval. And we see that the circular motions for the Jellum giants are quite different than those for the GES merger stars. 
So the gelum giants are moving relatively faster and they seem to be more similar to the disk stars. So next we looked at the chemistry of the gelum member to see if we could learn something about its origin. So after a star is born, it maintains a unique chemical signature, kind of like a tag throughout its life. So just like with motion, stars born together can show patterns in their chemistry. So as one example, this figure shows the amount of alpha elements and heavy metals for stars in Apogee DR16. And we have our gelum giant marked in blue. So to see if gelum is associated with a particular satellite galaxy or a globular cluster, let's add some stars from those populations to this figure. So here I've added in stars from two satellites that the Milky Way has accreted, uh, Carina and Sculptor, and we see that these accreted stars do fall into the same region as the gelum giant. Now I've added in stars from globular clusters, and globular clusters can actually form in situ, meaning inside the Milky Way, or they can be accreted. And when we add the globular clusters in, we see that every population falls into the same region as our gel gelum giant in this space. So while we can't pinpoint the exact origin of the gelum stream, we can compare orbits of the gelum and the GES stars found in our Apogee data. So we calculated the orbits um, over 5 billion years. And on the left is the orbit for our Apogee gelum giant. And on the right are the orbits for the GES stars in our survey. And each different color is a different GES star. So based on their very different orbits, the gelum stream is seemingly not part of the stars from the GES merger. And this is significant as how and to what extent um, streams are connected across the sky, tells us about the formation history of the Milky Way and other spiral galaxies in the universe. So to sum it up, we have found the brightest known member of the Gelum stellar stream. The Gelum stream stars may have originated in a satellite galaxy or a globular cluster, and stars from the GES merger do not appear to be associated with the Gelum stellar stream. So thank you. Hello, my name is Karen Masters. I'm a uh, associate professor at Haverford College, which is a small liberal arts college uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, I'm also the spokesperson for SDSS4, um, but I'm delighted uh, to be here today to talk to you about some of my own work uh, with the manga survey part of SDSS. So just to start, let me introduce manga. Manga is a spectral mapping survey of nearby galaxies. Uh, so you might think of a galaxy survey and think of lots of images, uh, like this beautiful image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, of course, as astronomers, we really like to take spectra of galaxies. Uh, these detailed rainbows um, can be read uh, almost like a barcode to tell us uh, a lot of information about the stars um, and the ionized gas that make up a galaxy. And SDSS over its 20 year history has taken uh, spectra like this for millions of galaxies. Uh, what's a little bit special and different about the manga survey is that instead of taking a single spectra per galaxy, um, like illustrated in the black circle, uh, manga takes many, many spectra across the face of many, many galaxies. Uh, we do this uh, with the manga instrument, which is a fiber a hexagonal fiber bundle. Um, we have 17 of them uh, in total that we can put on the sky at once. Um, and we ran a survey for six years from 2014 to 2020 um, at Apache Point Observatory. Um, and our final sample is just a little bit over 10,000 galaxies. Um, these data are um, many dimensional and complex and we have them for many, many galaxies. And so that causes uh, data science challenges. Uh, one of the most productive techniques for dealing with this so far has been um, different kinds of averaging of these data. Um, so some examples of this here, um, this galaxy, uh, this is the image from SCSS uh, legacy imaging uh, with the hexagon showing the region where Manga took data. Um, and you can um, do your best job at fitting ovals to this. Um, and then uh, within each of these oval uh, annually, you would average the spectra and then you can make a plot um, like the one shown here where you show some property as a function of radius from the center of the galaxy. 
Uh, one benefit of doing that, which is illustrated again uh, by this plot from a different, uh, a different um, result using Manga data, is that if you then scale that by the size of the galaxy, you can add up multiple galaxies. And so this plot is showing, uh, for this example, this is to do with the chemical enrichment of the gas in the galaxies, um, showing how it depends both on radius, but also the mass of, of the galaxy um, in, in a large sample of galaxies. Uh, but this is ignoring some of the beautiful complexity in the manga data. We don't just have radially average data, we actually have full two-dimensional information. Um, so here's some examples of that. Again, the top row is the SCSS imaging for four galaxies in the manga sample with the hexagon showing the region where we have taken spectra. And below, I'm showing some examples of just some of the maps that we can make with the manga data. This first one shows where we see ionized hydrogen in this galaxy, revealing, uh, in this case, uh, AGN accretion or accretion onto a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy from star formation. This is a different view of ionized hydrogen, um, highlighting more the star formation in the spiral arms of this galaxy. Uh, this is a spectral measurement which correlates with the ages of, of stellar population or ages of stars, showing they tend to be older in the centers of galaxies. But again, there's structure um, that is not azimuthally symmetric. Um, and in addition to these spectral measurements, we will show you the motions of the stars and the gas, thanks to the Doppler effect that Hannah beautifully described earlier. Um, detecting this complexity is a challenge for computers. Um, and so just as a little bit of proof of that, you might have recently seen this security check to prove that you're not a robot um, at a social media site. Um, you're asked to pick the spiral galaxy because identifying patchy spiral structure is a challenge uh, from computers. By the way, none of those are spirals. Uh, but we know how to deal with this in astronomy. I've been involved in Galaxy Zoo now for more than 13 years. Um, the original Galaxy Zoo, we showed images, SGSS images of a million galaxies and asked people to identify whether, whether or not they could see spiral structure. Now in Galaxy Zoo 3D, we made use of the Zooniverse Project Builder software um, to build in the browser a project where we instead invite people to identify where they see spirals um, in the galaxy. So this is what our site looked like. Um, this is showing the spiral arm question um, and a user might draw over it much like um, you might have done in uh, paint when you were playing with computers, um, you can, can draw over things. We asked about the location of spirals, but also um, we asked people to indicate uh, the galaxy center if they saw any foreground stars, so stars from our own galaxy um, that are just happened to be in front of the galaxy that we're interested in. Um, spiral arms and galactic bars, which are these linear structures across the faces of some galaxies. Um, and we made use of galaxy zoom morphologies to only ask people to draw spiral arms in galaxies where we knew there was a spiral arm. Uh, this got launched to the Zooniverse pool of, of classifiers. Um, and in the first couple of days, we were collecting 100,000 drawings per day. Um, we ran in two phases. And in the second phase, we were able to finish. And we've collected these data for every manga galaxy that's been observed. Um, this is a crowdsourcing technique, so we actually collect 15 drawings um, for each task on each galaxy. And in total, that's over a million different drawings um, from 8,000 registered volunteers and also probably some volunteers who didn't register. Um, so this is what the combined result might look like for one galaxy. Um, so here again is the galaxy shown in the SDSS imaging with the hexagon. Um, and this now is the crowdsourced heat map. So in orange, it's showing where people have indicated there's a bar in this galaxy. Uh, fewer people have uh, marked spiral arms here. So this is quite pale blue for the spiral arm. We see the galaxy center indicated and also um, just faintly some stars which happen to be outside of the hexagon. The instructions were um, to focus inside the hexagon but people um, often drew outside as well. Um, we can then combine that with the manga data to do all kinds of interesting things. Um, so here is an example of that. I've put the contour showing where um, the citizen scientists indicated there's a bar in this galaxy on top of the ionized hydrogen map. And you can see how um, the uh, knots in the ionized hydrogen are correlating with the structure of the bar. Um, we can also do things like this, uh, which is showing um, each uh, spatial pixel in this data as a point on this plot. Um, plotted at the angle that it is around the galaxy. Um, so if the galaxy were azimuthally symmetric and was the same at every, had the same flux at every radius, you just see horizontal lines in this, uh, but we can see that the structure um, the, the, in this example, ionized hydrogen peaks um, at around the angles where we see the bar. 
Um, so that's for one galaxy, but the real power of having these crowdsourced masks is that we can actually use um, spatial information uh, in an in a automated way from multiple galaxies. So there's a couple of examples of that having been done. Um, in this result that was published in 2019, um, we used 128 galaxies with, with bars indicated in Galaxy Zoo 3D, and we were able to show that the radial age gradient in the stars was flatter in the bars um, than in the interbar region, so parts of the disk that are outside the bar. Um, and at this meeting, a student who works with me at Haverford has a poster where he's been making use of the spiral masks um, from Galaxy Zoo 3D, and here's one result um, from his work showing that about half of all of the stars uh, are forming within the spiral arms in Manga. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, just to summarize, I um, presented crowdsourced feature masks for all 10,000 galaxies in the SDSS4 Manga survey. Um, this is a really nice step towards being able to use all the beautiful complexity in the Manga data. Um, we aim to release these masks alongside the final data release of the Manga survey, uh, which will happen or is scheduled to happen in December of this year. And there'll be a paper coming about out or being submitted about this very soon. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to follow all of these exciting results. Um, I'm the director of SDSS4 and I'm joined by Juna Kohlmeyer, the director of SDSS5. And before starting, we just wanna congratulate David Weinberg and Robert Lupton who were just awarded the Danny Heinemann prize uh, for their work on SDSS. They were mentors to us uh, early in the project and it's very exciting to see the well-deserved uh, award. But what we want to do today is to, uh, to look from 30,000 feet at what, where SDSS is and where it's going. So right at this moment, SDSS-4 is finishing its observations uh, after its six-year survey. And these observations are done with spectroscopic plug plates, which are precision drilled plates, which allow us to place spectroscopic fibers in the telescope focal plane and observe hundreds of spectra at a time. And over the last 20 years, we've uh, observed over 10,000 of these plates. Um, and what that's allowed us to do in SDSS-4 is with EBOS to finish the SDSS redshift survey program um, with, in the end, over 3 million redshifts and the largest 3D map of the universe. And as Karen described, to also perform the Manga Integral Field Survey uh, with, again, the largest uh, uh, sample of its kind with over 10,000 nearby galaxies. And um, as we also heard, uh, observations of stars in the Milky Way and its satellites uh, in the infrared with 700,000 stars. And so, this has been a very, a very exciting to conclude this program, um, more exciting than we planned. Uh, we had to close in 2020, which was a difficult uh, year, but we, were, we did manage after a few months to reopen at both our Northern and Southern sites. Our creative and dedicated staff uh, created new procedures that would be safe to reopen under and we managed to finish our Northern program in August and we are finishing our Southern program next week. And we have a very busy 2021 with creating science results and creating the final data release for SDSS-4, which will be the 17th public data release from SDSS overall. So with these 10,000 plates, we've done once we're done with them, we've done all sorts of interesting things, but the most interesting thing has been the plates to education program, which I wanna mention briefly. Hundreds of plates have been distributed to classrooms across the world, or along with materials and training, so that teachers can teach units in astronomy based on an actual piece of astronomical hardware that's been used to map the universe, um, corresponding to a piece of sky associated, you know, a specific, a specific piece of sky associated with that plate for that class. And so these plates are very near and dear to our hearts. They've, they've become these beautiful artifacts, but 
with SDSS4, we've really saturated what can be done technologically with plates. And I'm going to turn it over next to Juno Kohlmeyer, who's going to discuss how SDSS5 is going to move beyond plates to revolutionize how SDSS works and, and make it ready for the astrophysics of the 2020s. So with that, I will turn it over to Juna. OK, thank you so much, Mike. Um, you know, the plate technology in SDSS has served the community extremely well over the past 20 years, as we've just heard, and continues to, to serve the community very well. And it's really a marvel. But we know that the night sky is not static. It's dynamic. And it's constantly changing over all time scales. And in order to probe more objects and over all these time scales, we need to change our technology. And this is why SDSS has been developing a robotic fiber positioning system, which includes 500 robots in each of our two telescopes, each carrying infrared and optical fiber. And with these robots, what used to take hours to do can now be done in minutes. Next slide. So SDSS-5 is mapping the universe from stars to quasars, and we divide the science into three mapper programs. Our Milky Way mapper will map about 5 million stars of all different types across the entire galaxy. Our local volume mapper will probe the Milky Way and nearby galaxies to really try to understand why galaxies don't form as many stars as they're capable of forming. And our black hole mapper will probe around half a million black holes across the sky. And you might be wondering, why do we need so many objects? Why isn't it simply enough already? Next. So imagine looking at a painting, but you can only probe a fraction of it. So in the upper right, I'm showing a painting as it would be probed by our plate technology, sparsely sampled. Now in the lower left, I'm showing what that same painting looks like probed with our robotic system and it's dense sampling of millions of objects. And these are, uh, and of course, as you can see, the very rich structure of this painting, in this case, untitled by Jean-Michel Basquiat is revealed. And so too is the case with our universe. Next slide. Now 2020 was a tough year for SDSS and for the world. And I'm showing here just a sampling of our triumphs in building lots of stuff over the last year. And the only reason we were able to make this tremendous progress in the face of global lockdowns and contracts that were rendered void and null uh, is because of our incredible global team. Building this program during a pandemic is a major feat. It's like growing orchids in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And this team did it. So our scientists and engineers were taking calls around the clock, working in their bedrooms, in their kitchens, in their cars, taking delivery of equipment in their garages, all while facing illness, isolation, and personal loss. And thanks to their hard work and dedication, the robots are coming. And thanks to Sloan, we'll have more understanding of the stars, the galaxies, and the black holes in the cosmos than we've ever had in the history of mankind. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, I'm going to go ahead now and start up the question session at the moment. Haley, you can confirm, but it looks like we don't have any yet. That is correct. All right. So anyone listening in, please send in your questions via the Q&A. In the meantime, it looks like Rick has questions. <laughs> You're muted, Rick. Yes, I'm out. I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Yes, you were right. I always try to try to come up with some questions. So I have a, a few. Um, uh, first question is for um, Hannah and Jasmine. I think I heard Jasmine say that um, the accretion mechanism uh, in this symbiotic star is not the usual one, or, or, or is different than than what's often imagined for a symbiotic star. And I was wondering. If you could elaborate on that, uh, tell us uh, how you know, you know, what's the difference and how you know it's different. Yeah, so most symbiotic, at least, um, for the ones observed in our galaxy, 
uh, are assumed to be accreting via Roche lobe overflow, right? Which means that the, the giant star has expanded to fill what's called its Roche lobe, which allows mass to flow from the giant star to the white dwarf. However, there are some physics that determine how large the Roche lobe is. And based on our observations of this red giant star, the red giant's atmosphere is about a factor of two smaller than its Roche lobe radius, right? And so our giant star is too small, it's not filling its Roche lobe, but we know that matter is moving. So we have to have some other explanation that is not Roche lobe overflow. And so we think what is actually happening is instead of uh, the outer atmosphere of the star itself filling this Roche lobe, it's this very slow, dense wind that's typical of these types of stars, and that is what's filling the Roche lobe. So it's something called wind Roche lobe overflow. It's just a little bit different, okay. um, but it explains how you can still have accretion going on in these systems, even though your red giant is too small for standard Roche lobe overflow to be going on. And if it's a wind as opposed to overflow of the outer envelope, does is, is it mean that the, that the accretion rate is lower than it, it would typically be in a symbiotic star? It's actually higher. Hmm. Um, so, so what happens is the wind is focused towards the orbital plane. And so your accretion rate can actually be a factor of 10 higher than with standard Roche lobe overflow. And so okay. that actually helps explain some other phenomena that we observe with these types of systems. Great. I have a question for uh, Allison, and then I see we are getting some questions in the, in the Q&A box too. So um, how many stars have been identified as being part of this Jellum stream? Um, maybe you could divide that into how many are known versus how many you think might be there if you could see them all. Um, mm -hmm. and, and does that number give you any leverage in trying to figure out uh, whether it comes from a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy? Right, so the total number of stars now, so it's pretty much everything that I showed in the talk. So I don't know the exact number of the main sequence stars. I am just gonna like maybe guess a couple of thousand. And then of course the eight <laughs> red giant stars from that other study and then the one red giant star from our study. Um, and knowing the mass could definitely, it, well, it would still be tricky as we've <laughs> learned a lot through this study, globular clusters and satellite galaxies at low metallicities are just really, really difficult to um, distinguish. And there's been some estimates of the mass of the, um, the Jellum stream from the discovery paper. Um, I don't remember it offhand, but yeah, I think what needs to be done now is to, you know, find more, more members of the stream and, you know, we could kind of hone in on that question in a lot more detail. Okay, so perhaps we should uh, go to the Q&A box now. Sounds good. Uh, the first one is from, is for Dr. Masters from James Erton of the University of Washington. Are there plans to continue the citizen science projects related to galaxy shape? Does it have to be spiral arms? And are there citizen science endeavors to look at more complex arrangements? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and absolutely. So Galaxy Zoo, the original site um, is still running. Um, we're looking at images from the Dark Energy Camera Legacy Survey right now. And there's some really cool uh, stuff going on led by uh, uh, my colleagues at the University of Oxford where we're combining a machine learner uh, with people uh, right in the interface in Galaxy Zoo. So the machine learner does the easy stuff and the people do the stuff it cannot do. Um, in terms of more complex features, I'm really excited about a project we have called Galaxy Builder. Um, I had a student working on it where you could actually model the galaxies in the browser, making use of some nice uh, in-browser fits viewers. Um, we've done that for a small set of galaxies and that was my student's PhD project, but we'd like to continue that work um, uh, with more galaxies in the future. Great, thanks. Uh, quick reminder when you type your questions to please uh, state who they're for and your affiliation. Uh, the next one comes from Ethan, uh, Ethan Siegel. It's a question for uh, Dr. Masters and Ethan Siegel is with, uh, starts with a bang. How long will SDSS data continue to be useful once the Rubin, uh, once Rubin LSST becomes operational? Will it basically become the equivalent of running Fermi's, Fermilab's Tevatron once CERN's LHC is started up? Um, 
Thanks, Ethan. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think you're probably referring to the SDSS imaging. I just want to remind everyone that SDSS has taken millions of spectra and they absolutely are going to continue to be useful for years to come. Uh, thanks in part to the open data and data releases uh, that our team put out. Um, the imaging is shallower and lower resolution than some upcoming uh, and even existing surveys. Um, and what's interesting for me in my interest in galaxy morphology is to think about galaxy morphology as a function of image depth and think about the different structures you can see at different image depths. So I don't think it will become useless, um, but, but yes, there is some really nice imaging coming in the future that we look forward to looking at. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one comes from uh, Dan Cler Clery from Science Magazine for Juna and Michael. Why does SCSS have phases? Is it about updating technology or is it about answering different scientific questions? And how is it decided what to do in each phase? I have a hour long answer to this question, but, um, but it's, it's basically because we are interested in keeping, in doing large surveys and, but keeping those surveys relevant to the, the current context. And so, so there's, there's sort of a competition every five or so years for, for deciding on what the next phase will be. And that, that really has helped keep the facility you know, at the forefront and doing you know, relevant things to a very broad community. So, so that's, that's generally the, the motivation for, for doing it that way. I don't know if Juna has anything to add to that. No, I think that was a great summary, Mike. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one comes from Dan Fisher and it's not uh, directed at anybody, but I guess anybody can just jump in. Uh, how much of the hardware of the telescope in New Mexico is still original? Have there been significant upgrades to the optics or mechanics since the 1990s? And could it in principle be used forever uh, like some of the Mount Wilson or Palomar observatory telescopes? Well, forever is a long time. <laughs> and uh, in fact, a lot of the hardware that's currently still at Apache Point is original, but we are upgrading various elements over time. In fact, just this morning, the second lens of our new three element corrector lens arrived at Johns Hopkins where it's being made to uh, work with our robotic uh, system. So things, the focal plane is being completely transformed. The instruments are upgraded, um, you know, through uh, the, from the original spectrographs, of course, the imaging uh, cameras, those famous cameras that Karen mentioned are no longer on the mountain. And so we're able to give new life to telescopes. Uh, the mirror is still the original primary mirror, the, uh, the dome structure, not quite a dome, but uh, the roll off roof structure is the original structure. Um, maintaining these telescopes, once you've got a telescope where the optics are really, are really good, you wanna maintain it well for as long as you can. And these, these telescopes can find new purposes because in fact, there is so much structure to probe in the sky and so many new technologies that are, uh, that are coming online that actually just give these uh, you know, kind of old telescopes new life. And, and so yes, the telescope can go for many decades into the future. Great, thanks so much. Uh, and our last question for now is, oh, okay, there's another one came in. Uh, question for Dr. Sheffield from James Urton from the University of Washington. Could one stellar stream ever have multiple origins, like from um, miniature mergers of streams from different events? And are there examples of this? Hmm. I don't know of any examples offhand of this, but I can imagine some pretty interesting scenarios. So when accreted, when galaxies come in, like Sagittarius, for example, it brought in, or I should even say the Gaia Enceladus sausage, it brought in a bunch of globular clusters with it. So maybe you could have stars from the clusters coming in and then in mixing as well with everything else that's already happening in the halo and that could form some secondary streams. Um, I, it certainly seems like something that could be possible, um, but I don't know of any examples at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, so, oops, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I thought somebody else was gonna jump in. Okay, 
Uh, so the next one is from Nola Red from freelance slash face.com for Juna or Karen. Can you elaborate on the addition of the ro of the robots, how I guess how the robots will affect SESS observations? <laughs> so uh, the main advantage of the robots is that they allow us to uh, to get on to different targets very, very quickly. So Mike showed you those beautiful plug plates that have been working strong for us for decades. But you have to actually plug, you have to know all of those targets well in advance, drill that plate precisely, and then you have to manually plug that plate with a fiber optic cable. Now these objects will be able to be captured by our robotic system very, very efficiently. So instead of doing 700,000 stars, we're going to be uh, able to probe 5 million stars. So the efficiency that you get from not having to uh, go through that uh, uh, very intense uh, mechanical process is, is tremendous. Um. Great, thank you. Uh, so Beth Johnson has a question, uh, journalist from Cosmic Quest for Juna. How were the robots trained to do the right thing? Were they programmed or was it AI? Uh, so the robots are, uh, they, they are receive coordinates and then based on the position of the telescope, they have to go to those coordinates. And I just wanna highlight the work of a graduate student, uh, Connor Sayers from the University of Washington, who in collaboration with, the, uh, with uh, our, our our team has developed an extremely efficient algorithm for uh, for dictating where those robots go at each uh, at each pointing, uh, and and that is actually not a trivial thing. So so they're not trained uh, the way those dancing robots from uh, MIT are trained, uh, but they are programmed to uh, follow their instructions based on um, based on their positions on the sky and the targets that we want to observe. So. Uh, uh, and I, I, I just want to highlight the work of, of that graduate student uh, just, to, just to make it clear to, to everyone how important SDSS is for, uh, for, for training and for the innovation of, of the young people in our collaboration. Mike, do you want to add to that? Good. No? Okay. Uh, so Sorry, the next no. question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next question comes from uh, Nola Reed, freelance slash face.com, uh, for Dr. Sheffield. What makes the Jellum stream special? Can it be used to help understand some of the infalling uh, slash first pass LMC questions that have evolved uh, in the last decade? Uh, one reason it's special is actually its morphology. Um, and I didn't talk about that at all, but it's it actually has some gaps within the stream itself, which could be indicative of interactions with dark matter subhalos. Um, and that also can say a little bit about um, like globular clusters might tend to form this more. And in terms of the LMC, um, what was the specific question about the infall of the LMC and Jellum? Could they be related? Was that the question? Yes. Um, so. The question was, uh, what makes it special and can it be used to help understand some of the infalling slash first pass LMC questions that have evolved in the last decade? Okay, I don't think it could weigh in directly on the LMC. I just don't think based on their locations in the sky that the two and uh, the LMC the, and SMC are both much further away than Jellum. So I don't think it could weigh in on that specifically, but yeah, in general, it's just telling us a lot about the infall of galaxies in sort of a more um, broad sense. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Leslie Sage from Nature for Juna. Uh, how precisely can the fibers be placed by the robots? Do you achieve arc second precision? We actually achieve sub arc second pre uh, precision with our robots. They can be precise. Uh, they can be positioned very precisely. Uh, in fact, our plates, uh, you know, our uh, the fibers themselves are. Uh, are, are bigger than that precision. So, so indeed, our robots can achieve sub arc second uh, uh, precision in terms of the in terms of their their positioning. Uh, wow, I need that to get light into the right fiber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. 
so the next question is for Juna from Ryan Ridden Harper uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Will the new system enable target of opportunity observations of transients like supernovae? Indeed. Uh, so that's one of the real flexibilities of this program is that anything that goes off in your field of view can be immediately uh, acquired by the uh, by the system. And so, in fact, uh, we we can observe uh, target of opportunity events, gravitational wave events, uh, supernovae. Of course, you know SDSS has a has a long view in mind, and there are plenty of people who chase targets across the sky with much larger uh, apertures. But in fact, we're able to chase all the targets across the whole sky, and that's uh, that's useful. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions at this second. Uh, Rick, do you have any more questions? <laughs> Anything in the Slack channel, Sarni? Uh, no, no questions there, just compliments great. on the great science. Excellent. I did have one question still for Karen. Um, this seems like uh, tracing out the shapes of the galaxies is a lot more complicated than the usual yes, no that you expect to see on Galaxy Zoo. So was that difficult to develop and uh, how successful has it been in sort of getting consistent results or, or something that's actually useful? Yeah, it absolutely is more complicated, uh, and more complex. And I think we see uh, we see that a little bit in the, the number of volunteers that are engaged, but the people who did it, we found um, did an incredibly good job. And um, we really, um, you know, thanks to the Zooniverse and that community of, of people who are interested in contributing to citizen science, we were able to find the right people who could do a really good job of it. Um, developing the site was really easy with the project builder. Actually, I did most of the development um, of what was going to be shown on the site. Um, and that's totally cheating by saying it that way, because um, behind the scenes was an enormous amount of coding to get um, the tools available. Um, but if you want to build a, a crowdsourcing platform where you can ask questions, draw on images, uh, I think transcription as well, a number of kind of off the shelf tasks are available on the project builder for anyone to make use of, which is a really cool uh, thing that the Zooniverse has available. So, so that was great. That's awesome, thanks. And then I did have one more question uh, for Hannah and Jasmine. Um, maybe this is naive, but you're, you're reporting on something that's in a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. Do we have any likelihood of being able to see something from a galaxy even further away? Or is this already like at the threshold of what we could hope to detect? Um, so with Apogee, this is probably getting close to the threshold of what we have good enough data for. Um, however, there are many other known symbiotics in the local group. Um, so Andromeda has got a handful of them. Uh, we just don't have the abundant data uh, with yeah. Apogee for those systems. Okay, thank you. All right, well, we are running up against time here. So if we have no further questions, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you again to all of our excellent speakers today. Uh, thanks to Sloan as a whole for putting this session together. This has been a really great overview of the latest stuff coming out and I'm looking forward to uh, phase five. And uh, otherwise, thanks to the audience, all of you for being here today. We'll meet back again tomorrow at 12.15 p.m. Eastern time for the next session, which will be titled Bursting Magnetars. We'll see you all then. <laughs>